thank you for coming to my talk. So uh, the title is Predictive Load Balancing, Unfair and Faster and More Robust. My name is Steve Gurry. I'm working at Netflix in the Edge group, which is the group that do all the critical services at Edge. Uh, we have a booth located in the third floor, and uh, we also are hiring, obviously. Um, so I will start this presentation by asking, uh, what is load balancing? Um, I just want to specify that I'm talking about client-side load balancing and not hardware load balancer. Um, so what is load balancing? Um, that's answering this simple question. I have a set of servers that are all completely identical, and I want to ask a question to one of them, but which one do I talk to? And there was multiple ways of doing this. So during this talk, I will use lots of live demos. Um, this is one of them. You can see that on the left, you have a client. This is this blue uh, circle that sends a request to a server. The server is this green circle. On the left, you see this number, which basically represents the number of uh, requests that the server is actually processing. Uh, for simplicity, this is a, a single thread server. So it means that when the server is processing a request, uh, if it receives another one during that time, it needs to enqueue the request and then need to finish the first one before actually computing the next one. So when you have one server like this, there is basically nothing to do in terms of load balancing. Uh, but when you add multiple servers, this is where it's becoming uh, interesting. So during those examples, you will see on the top the name of the load balancing algorithm, in that case random, and some details about the, the speed, the uh, incoming rate of request. So the first one that everybody knows is uh, random, which is pretty easy. You roll a dice, you pick a number, and you select that server. Uh, there is nice property with random number generator. Uh, they are not biased to specific one specific number, so it means that over time, every server should receive the same number of requests. Another very common load balancing strategy is run Robin. Uh, with run Robin, basically the client is taking a, a very simple piece of information, um, the last server it talks to, and the next time you want to talk to another server, it picks the next one in the list. So you see you have this nice wave pattern of uh, requests coming from the client to the server and responses coming back from the server to the client. This one is very common and used almost everywhere. The third um, load balancing strategy that people use, uh, also very common, is called list loaded or uh, join the shortest queue. In that strategy, the client needs to have um, some sort of data structure locally that represents the number of outstanding requests that you sent to the server. So basically, every time you want to send a request, you, take, you, you pick the list loaded, so the smallest number in that array, and then you increment the number of requests that you send to the server. And when you receive the response, you just decrement that number. So that's pretty simple. So this is for the, the common, tech, common algorithm that everybody is using. But why do we care? I'm asking this question. Is there an impact on the performance of the system? Which brings back my memory of my first job. Uh, many years ago, I was working in a, a small um, video game company, and my first task was to design this specific server. So my tech lead told me, like, OK, like we have some server that we need to do. It needs to handle like five RPS. That's your first job. You need to handle it. So I worked on the client and the server, and very quickly I managed to have something that works. Uh, it was working steady state very well at 0.5 RPS. I didn't really manage to have better performance at that. And I came, I came to the tech lead and told him, I, I have this server. He told me, OK, fine, but uh, you also need to be sure that the P99 is below five seconds. Oh, I, I say, sure, um, but what's the P99? <laughs> so, uh, OK, let, let, let me tell you. Uh, if we graph over time the duration of every request, you will see, uh, like on this bottom latency plot, you will see that some requests are more expensive than others. Sometimes uh, some requests are just more computationally expensive. Or maybe you have some queuing on the server side. So they are not taking all the same time. If you draw a line, 
that basically split that graph into two areas. The P90 will be in that case, 90% of the points are below that line and 10% of the points are above that line. That's what we call the P90. And that's a, a very interesting measure um, to know the, the tail latency of, of those requests. There is something else that we can compute. It's the histogram. The histogram is basically, you count how many requests we receive at one specific latency. And the, the eighth of the bar is basically the number of requests that you receive, and the x-axis is the, 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 the latency of those requests. So we, we could keep track of the P99 on, on that histogram, so you see that it's 3.2 seconds. So I came to my tech lead and said, like, that's fine, we, we measured the P99, that's three seconds. The goal was to have something below five seconds, so we're good. It said, fine, yeah, but uh, I told you that the RPS should be five, not 0.5. It said, fine, like, we just use 10 times more server. Uh, <laughs> He said, yeah, let's see about that. And then we just like created uh, 10 times more server and we increased the RPS. I was pretty happy about that. And then I realized that all of a sudden, the latency characteristic of my system, I have like 10 identical servers behave differently. You can see on the latency plot on the bottom, like there is many outliers, the latency of those servers even though they are completely identical, like the system was worse. On the histogram, you see that the, the P99 is now at eight seconds. So at that time, it struck me. This is why distributed systems are hard. It's difficult to reason about them. If you take one server, one client, you understand very well how the behavior of those server and client are, are, is. When you multiply the number of servers, you have something different. Now you have a load balancing algorithm in place and you have all the problem of queuing. So why do we have this problem? It's because even though the random number generator are guaranteed that over time, every server will receive the same number of requests, it's actually possible that some server will be picked multiple times, and they will receive three consecutive requests. When it happens, you see that some server will be more loaded. You see that some server have a queue of like eight, nine, and some server are basically doing nothing with a queue of zero or one or two. So that, that's, that's the, the reason. So how can we solve that problem? There is two ways. The first one is the smart one. You switch to another load balancing algorithm. In that case, I use list loaded. So the client is basically trying to even out the load toward all those servers. And when you do that, you just need to wait a little bit for the queue of servers to drain, and you see on the latency plot that basically the system behaves kind of like a combination of small systems. Uh, if I wait a little bit, um, I, I need to wait about like 10 to 20 seconds that those bad data points disappear. You will see that the P99 should converge below five seconds, which was my goal. Yes, it does. That's the smart way. But at the time, I was not smart. <laughs> uh, so this is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it kind of worked the same way. <laughs> so you multiply the number of servers by two, and you have the same latency characteristic. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, too. <laughs> so load balancing implies the word balancing. And you have multiple strategies to do it. The first one is ensuring that each server receives the same number of requests. That's basically what random and round robin is doing. If I wait an hour and I look at the number of requests that each server is receiving, they will all be, the, roughly speaking, the same. The other strategy is to guarantee that at any point of time, every server have in the queue the same number of requests. That's basically the strategy of list loaded. The third strategy is to minimize some utility function at the client side, uh, for, for instance, the latency. And that's basically the strategy that I will describe in the next, uh, next few slides. But there is a couple of troubles that all load balancing algorithms are usually having. The first one is not all servers are always the same. 
you may have at some point some server that are a little bit slower or have some errors. Let me try to demonstrate that with one client talking to 10 servers using the round robin um, algorithm. We are in steady state and we start like sending traffic to servers. Everything is fine. I have a P99 four seconds. Everything is correct. Nothing, nothing to worry about. If all of a sudden I take the three first server and let's say something bad is happening to them, they, be, they become slow. On the client side, because you use one Robin, you don't have any piece of information, you don't keep stats per server, so you will continue to send, send traffic to those server the same way as before. You see like one after the other, it receives a request. Actually, those server are very latent, very, very slow, so you shouldn't do that. When you do that, you see on the latency graph that you have like points at very high latency. A better strategy would be to use least loaded algorithm. You, you see that on the client side, all the data, the data structure that you have, the slow server will have a high number. So the client will tend to favor all the lower server, the fast one, as long as you have enough fast server to talk to. When you switch to that strategy, you just send a very limited number of, of requests to the slow server, and you don't impact your P99 that much. Another trouble that you have with load balancing algorithm is a common one, which is called a sundering herd. It, it happens when multiple clients are focusing their, their traffic on a subset of the cluster. And I'll try to demonstrate that. That, that one is pretty difficult to, to demonstrate, so uh, it may, may not be that obvious. So in that case, I have two clients sending traffic to a series of six servers. We are in steady state. Everything is fine. I have a P99 of five seconds. Let me try to simulate a typical uh, outage. So let me increase the traffic. Now, all the servers don't have enough resources to answer the traffic. So what will happen is basically they will start queuing messages, the queue will grow, and then some alerts will fire, and people will be paged, and people came back, and they say, oh, those servers are loaded. What do I do? I start new servers. <laughs> <laughs> but those servers are slow. And all of a sudden, all the clients send all the traffic to those new servers. But those servers, because they are slow, they buffer all the, the request, and they will come back. So yeah, they, they happened. Um, so that's actually the, the opposite of what you should do. You should slowly warm up those servers, and when they are warm enough, then you even have the load. In that case, you see in the latency plot that you have a couple of points that are very high in terms of latency. Those points are basically all the data that you send to those slow servers. And you should have avoided doing that. The third trouble is that we want to be resilient towards um, in presence of outliers. Um, what is an outlier? Uh, it's basically if you have used a server that runs on the JVM, you probably have heard of the term GC pose. That's basically when the JVM is collecting memory and usually it's unavailable for hundreds of milliseconds up to sometimes seconds. So in that example, we have this uh, client talking to six server. Um, we are in steady state, P99 of 3.5 seconds. Everything is fine. And all of a sudden, I take two random server and I create a GC pose. From the client point of view, because it doesn't keep track of anything, any stats on the server side, basically it will continue to send traffic to every server, one after the other. And what will happen on the, the the GC post server, it, they will basically queue those requests. And you see on the latency point that when they came back alive, they basically drained the queue. And I've spent something about 16 slow requests because of that. If I switch to list loaded and I do the same thing, on the client side, you will have this data structure that keeps track of the number of requests you sent. And you will see that those slow servers that are basically in GC pos, they will receive two requests. And after that, the server, the client just sent all the traffic to the lower part of the server. 
In that case, I only wasted two, uh, four requests because of those servers, not 15 or 16 like in the previous case. The impact on the P99 is drastically reduced. The fourth trouble um, is the, the fact that a large cluster of servers may dilute the local state that you, is kept by client. So what, I, what do I mean by dilute? Um, let's take another example. Um, you have one client talking to five servers and using the least loaded algorithm, we're in steady state. So the client keep track in this local data structure of the number of outstanding requests. If all of a sudden I keep the same RPS, but I multiply the number of clients, now I have six clients. So each client is having this data structure internally, and there is no coordination between clients whatsoever. So for some clients, you see that you have lots of zeros, which means that the next time you want to pick a server, you randomly choose one of those zeros. So the, the value of, of this data structure is actually reduced. When you have only one client, you are almost have the perfect view of the queue of the server. When you have many clients, you have a diluted, diluted view of uh, those, those servers. So if I want to draw a load balancing matrix of uh, the, the algorithm versus the dif different problems that we see, so uneven servers, servers that are slow or fast, rendering early is everybody rushing toward the same uh, sets of servers, outliers is being resilient toward DC, and large cluster is when you have thousands of clients, are you resilient? They all have problems. They manage to work well for specific conditions, but they all have problems. So the question that I ask is, is there a load balancing algorithm that works with uh, all those problems? And the answer is, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I will present to you this uh, new technique that we uh, worked on, we call that predictive load balancing. And the idea is pretty simple, is to use the latency as uh, the measure of the load that you send on servers. Um, so basically when you do list loaded, you count how many requests you send to servers. With latency-based load balancing, you, you send how many milliseconds of CPU you send to servers, and you load balance based on that. So let's take an example, a simple one. You have two servers, one at 50 milliseconds, the other one at 120 milliseconds. On the client side, you want to send a request, so we'll pick the least loaded. Uh, the load of those two servers is 50 for the first one and 120 for the second one, so you pick the first one. The load of the first one becomes uh, 100. It's two times the, num the latency. You, another request is coming, you want to select a server, in that case, 100 is still lower than 120, so you select the first one again. Uh, the load of the first server becomes uh, 150. Again, another request is coming on the client side, you want to send it. In that case, the second server is actually the, the one that you favor. So you will send a request to the second server. And obviously, when you receive a response, you just decrement the load from the value of the latency. So you see that by doing this, you favor the faster server compared to the slowest one. And it's pretty simple to keep track on the client side. You just have to have the latency and you count how many requests you send. So because it's, fa it's favoring fast server, it kind of work on the, uh, the problem of uneven server. If you have a, 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 a cluster of fast and slow server, that algorithm will favor the fast one. But I use like the word latency. That's pretty difficult to say that when you send tons of requests to server, you never have one latency. You have a, an histogram of latency. Um, in that example, uh, this is actually uh, an histogram of latency of an actual production server at Netflix. So you see that most of the requests are answered at about 70 milliseconds, but you also have requests that are answered at 20 milliseconds, and some are at 140, and some above that. So how can we extract a number from that histogram? There was one thing that we know is if I take two histograms from one client to two servers, it's roughly stable. It looks like the same. We know that if 5% of the request 
take more than uh, 100 milliseconds on server B, server B, same thing will happen on server A. So the value that we collapse that histogram to, uh, toward is actually the median. The median is the, uh, the value that cut that graph in two, two, two uh, equivalent area. That's a very stable value. Um, and we want a stable value because we don't want that eating an outlier uh, impact that, that, uh, that value. If you use an average, for instance, and then you send a request to a server, and it turns out that it's an expensive request, you don't want to change the, your expectation about that server. It's only when the server itself becomes slow that you want to change that value. The other problem with the median is uh, recency is actually important. Um, this is a latency plot so from some actual uh, production server at Netflix. And you see that over time, there is some action that could happen that may make the server actually slower and sometimes significantly slower. So you want to have some measure of the latency, this median, that actually uh, move quickly when the server is becoming slow. Oops. Oops. So we use the streaming median latency. Uh, basically, it's kind of measuring the, med the, the median over a sliding window. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I don't really have time to explain all the details. Um, that's a stable value, and that's also represent uh, recent data. So I'm running a simulation in the background. I'm uh, having a client like talking to different servers. And this red line that you see is basically this median, which is computed on the fly. What we want to have is the median moving quickly when the server is becoming slower. So if I make those server slower, I want the median to jump pretty quickly. That's basically what I have. If again, take those servers, I make them slower, the median is jumping. And we want to have some pretty stable value and also uh, jumping pretty quickly when the server is uh, becoming slower. If I took those, take those servers fast, fast enough, again, it should very quickly recover to the previous value. But again, diverge in the details, and uh, there was many things that I never really talked about. Uh, one is like how to estimate the latency of a new server. Like I have a set of servers, I bring one new server to the pool, I never talk to that server, I have no idea what's its latency characteristic. How do I basically you talk to it? Uh, what if the latency estimation is off? Like let's say that I bring a core server to the pool, uh, that server needs one minute to be fast. I first estimate the latency, that latency is high. Maybe I will never talk to that server again. And what about fast server that actually are fast because they are dropping most of their requests? <laughs> so for, for the first case, uh, we solved that problem with this simple state machine. When you bring a server to the pool, uh, if you never talk to that server, it became the best server ever. Its latency is zero. So obviously the next request that you will send is toward that server. And after that, immediately after that request, it becomes the worst server ever. So the, its latency is becoming almost infinity. And during this, this phase between the request, between sending the request and receiving the response, um, we have this some sort of probation mode where we basically don't send any more traffic to that server until we receive the response. After that first response, we have like one latency data point and we just uh, use it like a regular server. Um, it's being part of the pool like any other server. So you see that that technique basically it's some sort of warm up mechanism. When you bring new server to the pool, you will send like a few requests to estimate the latency. And you, if that server is slow, um, you won't talk to that server again and use that to basically warming up those servers. So that's useful. But what if uh, the latency estimation is off? Especially when you bring new server, new call server to the pool, it's very frequent that those servers need few seconds or sometimes minutes to actually be fast. And um, when you first estimate the median latency, if that median is too high, 
you will never talk to that server again. So that's why we decay the value when we don't talk to that server for a long time. And two, two cases could happen. That value decay, then it's equal to the other servers, and then you talk to that server again. Maybe it's becoming fast now, then you bring that server to the pool, or it's still slow, and then the latency is jumping up, and then will decay also after, after a while. The other annoying case is the problem of fast server, but bad server. Um, so to solve that problem, there was two things that we do. One is we only measure the latency of a successful response, um, successful responses. If uh, a server is sending lots of errors, but very quickly, we don't measure those, or those errors. We only uh, measure the, the successful response. And at the same time, we also measure the success rate which we use for basically um, favoring or penalizing servers. So if one server is sending 20% of errors and all the other servers are actually at 100%, we will, we will penalize that server by a 20% uh, uh, latency increase. So if its latency is 100 milliseconds, but send 20% of errors, then its latency became 120. A third problem that we have it's the problem of uh, keeping fresh statistics. When you have large cluster of clients and servers, um, when one client is connecting to all servers, your statistics for every server may be a little bit out of date. Um, that's happened because we have too many connections. And, and a simple example, let's say that you have a cluster of 10,000 servers and you send like every client is sending 1,000 RPS. That's basically one request every 10 seconds per server. So six requests every minute. That's not enough to have like accurate statistics per server, especially when we know that a GC could happen at any time, or the server could have some background thread running or some compaction that could happen. So you need to have like more fresh statistics. The way we do that is by sizing the number of connections based on the number of outstanding uh, request. So you have 10,000 servers, but if you, you lit, the average latency is 10 milliseconds, uh, it means you could do 100 RPS. So to do 1,000 RPS, you just need 10 servers. You don't need 10,000 servers. So if every client is sub-selecting 10 servers in this big pool, everybody should be happy and you should have like fresh statistics. That's um, a little bit more complicated than that because many clients may choose the same server and you will have overloaded servers. So to work around that problem, every client is basically refining its view all the time, evicting slow servers, the servers that are picked by multiple clients. So you see that it's our way of working around this problem of large cluster that dilute any information that you have on the client side. We do it by subselecting a, a view from the, the cluster from the client point of view. So all those statistics are fine, but the big problem is we need one slow response to realize that the server is slow. We would like to know that the server is slow before you actually reply to us. That's kind of interesting. So that guy is uh, Agne Arlong, nothing related to the programming language. He was not a, a programmer, he was a mathematician. Uh, that's the, the founder of uh, the Curing theory. And uh, in its original paper, he had this concept of instantaneous traffic, um, which basically means at any point of time, how much load did you offer to uh, servers? And we'll use that as our measure of the instantaneous value of the load. So the idea is pretty simple. We use the elapsed time per request as the value of load offer uh, to a server. So if I t equal 10, I send a request. At t equal 25, uh, I estimate that the server has consumed 15 milliseconds of latency, 15 milliseconds of work that could be CPU or anything. So that's my estimation at that time, 25, of the load consumed by the server. If at the same time I send another request to the server, at t equal 40, I estimate that the server has consumed 
30 milliseconds of CPU for the first request and 15 milliseconds of CPU for the second request. And then I compare that to the actual prediction that I had. So I predicti predicted that the latency of that server should be 20 milliseconds. Um, and I sent two requests to that, ser to that server. At, f at t equal 40, I realized that my prediction is actually a little bit off. And then I use this instantaneous duration, I the new load of the server. So that's great for things like GC pose. Um, as we size the number of connections based on the number of outstanding requests, it means that we basically need between one and two median latency to discover that one server is latent. So if your uh, median latency is 10 milliseconds, uh, you will detect a GC pose in between 10 and 20 milliseconds. And you don't need to spend tons of requests and discover that you have tons of timeout. You will see that way sooner. So you see from the mat matrix that we were fine with the outliers. So now that's where I demo that things. Um, I, will use, I will do it very slowly so that you can like, understand what's going on. Uh, it, may, it may take time to converge, and I hope that it will converge. Um, so on, on the left side, Next to the client, you will see the load, which is what we estimate for the load of the server. The median will be our estimation of the median, and that number will be the number of requests that we send to the server. So initially, the load will be zero, because we never talk to those servers. We'll pick one server, we'll have the penalization, so very high load, and when we go back, we, we got back a response, then uh, we'll have some data. So the, the middle server has been chosen. The first one, we see a response, we have some median latency. Next one to be packed should be the bottom one, yeah. And we'll receive a response soon. Okay, now we have median latency and we start like our normal day-to-day -day load balancing technique. Let's complexify things a little bit. Let me increase the RPS and uh, also increase the number of servers. So the system will basically try to increase the number of servers it talks to, but it will also slowly warm up those servers, send only one request, wait for the response bef before having, having any data, and refine its view. You can see on the left side that sometimes the number is growing very quickly. That's where when the instantaneous duration is taking over the predicted value. So it takes a little bit of time in that case because the RPS is very low, but basically the idea is the system will collect statistics per server, it will refine its view, so it will try to uh, talk to every server and evict all the slowest ones. And now if I turn those three first server into slow ones, what do I want is basically that that client should be able to recognize that those servers are slow and those median latency should converge to a, a slower value. And what will happen on the client side is it will try to favor the lowest part of um, the, the, the bottom uh, five server, the fast one. And if now I increase the number of clients, this is where it's becoming uh, tricky. Um, so I need to wait a little bit for all the clients to collect statistics per servers. And what should happen is they will collect statistics, they will discover that the first three servers are slow, and they will favor the bottom one. Uh, what could happen is some clients may uh, talk, multiple clients may pick the same server. So that server will be a little bit overloaded, but they will realize that because they will see that that median is likely the worst from their point of view, and they will evict that server, which will make that server fast again, um, which will even out. So if I wait again, common algorithm, you can do it. <laughs> um, the P99 that you see on the, on the top is 15 seconds. 
should decrease to at least 10. So the, the thing is, it, it, needs a, it needs a while to converge because, yeah, again, it's 10 now. It needs a while to converge because of two things. The RPS is very low, and uh, I compute the P99 over 30 seconds window. Yeah, 5.9 seconds. It's the beauty of that algorithm. Now if I switch to some other algorithm, like random, random doesn't have any information, doesn't keep track of anything, so all clients may overload specific servers, could be the, f the slow one, could be the fast one, and the P99 should jump. You see it's already at 15 seconds. What could happen also is, um, uh, yeah, I already told that, that um, the clients may overload one, one specific server by just like choosing it. So already 19 seconds for the P99. So you could say, yeah, but that's because random is the kind of the worst algorithm from all of them. If I switch to list loaded, which should be one of the best, um, let me wait a little bit to see if it converge. I can already tell you that it won't. <laughs> and <laughs> it will stay at between 15 and 20 seconds, which is definitely worse than five seconds. Yeah, it's definitely not decreasing. Do you guys we think we should wait or? <laughs> <laughs> I think like there is no way like I waited uh, long enough to know that it won't converge. But uh, nothing is perfect. Uh, that algorithm works in most cases, but not all of them. There is cases where the latency is not a good proxy for resource consumption. Um, when you do long polling or um, in case like that, uh, the latency of the request has nothing related to the state of the server. Um, under the problem that we have, and we discovered that when we were deploying code uh, at Netflix, is that slow, you have a very slow warm-up of call servers. When you think about it, the load balancing algorithm is doing what it's supposed to do, just you see slow servers to stop talking to them and focus on the fast one. So when you do a new version of the code, like you deploy new servers, the load balancing algorithm will talk to those servers and say, oh, they are slow, so I'm focusing on the fast one and stop talking to those servers, the latency will decay, and then again you will talk to those servers, they are still slow, you focus on the fast one, latency will decay again, you'll talk to those servers, oh, now they are fast, and then you, you bring those servers into the pool. But sometimes it takes tens of minutes to do that. So deploying new code takes more time. Um, but again, it takes more time, but you have no impact on the P99. Um, one, one thing that was really annoying for us is that it defeat canary analysis. Um, so at Netflix, we have lots of automated systems. When we push code in production, we basically have a canary that runs in parallel, and we have machine learning that up, look at all those stats and see if some of them are a little bit off. Um, in that case, you bring two, two clusters of the one version of the code and the new one, and then you run that algorithm. Basically, the algorithm will detect that, oh, that new version of the code is either faster or slower. And if it's faster, receive all the traffic. If it's slower, it don't receive any traffic. So when you try to apply machine learning on the stats, you will see that they are all over the place. Nothing is, you, you can't compare. It's not apple to apple. In one case, it receives thousands of RPS, and the other server, 10 RPS. So you, you can't really uh, make meaningful analysis of that. So we had to shadow traffic like split the traffic in two and analyze that. Um, the last thing um, that we discover actually in production that was annoying is it doesn't cope well with uh, error disguised as successes. Um, so for, for that one, we had a, a server that basically when something bad was happening, it was replacing the response with some default value and it was not telling anything to the client. So from the client point of view, 
one particular server was super fast because it was returning default value all the time. <laughs> so uh, the way we solved that problem was actually by writing good code. Uh, <laughs> that's always good. Keep that in mind. So instead of returning a success when you actually have an error, we return an error. And we say, OK, it's an error. But if you want, I have some default value that you can use. So in that case, the load balancing algorithm knew that it was actually an error and uh, uh, didn't basically count that, that value um, in the median. The other surprising thing is that the request distribution may be temporarily uneven. When you look at your cluster, uh, you may have some server that are like normally loaded and some server that are not because they are cold or because you just bring them. And it may be a little bit surprising to analyze your, your, uh, your cluster. You will have uh, data all over the place. Um, in our case, it was a little bit uh, annoying because we use AWS and we had a system that scale up automatically. And the, the value that we use was the load average. So when we bring a new, um, new servers into the clusters, uh, the previous one was maybe a little bit more loaded, and the new one was actually underloaded. But when you look at the average, everything seems fine, even though the distribution is a little bit different. Uh, so in, in situations like this, you need to be more careful about the data that you have, and you need to look at uh, percentiles, actually, instead of average. So in conclusion, uh, I would want to say that that's the only algorithm with four checks. Um, that's easy to say because that I designed those checks. <laughs> <laughs> it's still uh, experimental. There was only one production server, a service at Twitter that used it. So it's not like widely deployed. And uh, your mileage may vary, obviously. Um, I'm sure there was cases where uh, it needs some tweak tweaking. But in most cases, uh, I would say it should work pretty well. Thank you.